Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing. EFI is very uh, glad to host this briefing this afternoon, taking a look at the Green North Plan and what we, uh, and, and what is really part of this, and so we are very, very glad to have some of our EPA here to talk about that, as well as a very important organization whose memberships are, are state. Um, stakeholders in this whole important issue. My name is Carol Brenner. I'm the Executive Director of the ESI Environmental and Energy Studies Institute. As we all know that there has been a lot of anticipation with regard to the release of the final uh, rule for the <coughs> power plan, uh, which will be published, we believe, sometime in, in the next uh, month. We can go over more about that. Um, and, and we are very, very glad that we are joined today by the heads of several very important state-based organizations uh, as we look at this very important issue in terms of how the Clean Power Plan is able to, again, is able to address uh, very, very key issues in terms of the whole world of energy as we move into the in this very important power sector and the kinds of opportunities uh, as well as challenges that it uh, provides at the state level uh, as the states look at the kind of flexibility that they are being given uh, by the uh, proposed, by, by the uh, plan that is an issue by the Environmental Protection Agency. So to start us off today on our discussion, we will hear first from Joe Goffin, who is the Associate Assistant Administrator for Climate and the Senior Counsel uh, to the Assistant Administrator for Air Navigation of EPA. And Joe has been at EPA since 2009. He has worked on a whole variety of Um, and try to focus as much as possible on, on what the state's options are. 
the uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, always reminded that uh, many of our slides are rather uh, dense um, in their composition, and that's why this is a good point to remind you all that the uh, uh, slide deck I'll be using is on our website and uh, available for a uh, closer study that you might be able to, to uh, apply to it now. Um, uh, the changes we made um, uh, uh, focus in, in, in a couple of different areas. Um, uh, as you know, our first job is to establish a determination of what's about the best system of emission reduction. That's our job, EPA's job, um, to do a, a qualitative and quantitative analysis what works best um, to reduce carbon pollution, and then translate that into a standard. Um, moving from proposal to final, um, we focus exclusively on the generation side. After having proposed uh, what we call building blocks that represent a combination of generation and demand side. Um, at final, we base the standard only on dispatch operational efficiency Plants uh, and greater use of zero renewable generation. Um, demand side energy efficiency will no longer part of the mandate um, as expressed in the ESMR standard, um, is certainly, uh, uh, in our view, a major option for complying with the standard that either states using uh, public programs or the utilities participating in public programs. We're using uh, using the, the market for energy services in the value themselves. Uh, and while we took uh, building block four, the demand side management, out of the mandate, we still see it um, as a prime example um, of how you can achieve uh, carbon reductions um, while maximizing cost savings and overall operational efficiency of the system. Um, we pay a lot of attention to uh, the timing of the questions. Now, we express the standard um, in two tiers. Um, first is an interim target, um, and then is a final target. The final target being uh, in place in 2030, and the interim target representing um, a standard that had to be met on average over a multi-year period. Um, at proposal, um, we define that multi-year period over the course of 10 years between 2020 and 2029. And our intention was to give states and utilities um, a significant amount of flexibility in choosing the time at which they achieve emissions reductions over that 10-year period. Um, we got uh, voluminous and abundant comment to the effect that while everybody appreciated the lip service we gave, to allowing states and utilities to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, choose their own emission reduction trajectory for the live path. The way we calculated the standards, the way we uh, generated the state goals, really is a practical matter, did not allow that. Um, at final, we were determined to deliver on that on the commitment. Uh, and from our own analysis and the feedback we've gotten since August 3rd, when the administrator signed the rule, it. Um, the feedback we got was that this time we uh, got it right. Um, not only do utilities have until 2022 as opposed to 2020 um, to register their first reductions, but the way we structured uh, the phasing in of the standards for coal and natural gas plants uh, and therefore the state targets that are derived from those standards um, will work to provide utilities with the kind of flexibility that we intend to provide all along. Um, uh, one of the things that people noticed about the proposal is that um, we defined the best system of emission reduction and expressed the uh, standard, if you will, that, that, that represented the determination by means of state targets. Uh, and uh, a great many commenters observed that that is not exactly how Clean Air Act, Clean Air Act, in particular Section 111, um, uh, applies to the sources themselves, applies to the emitters themselves. So we made a, a significant
significant shift in how we calculate the application of the SAR. And we apply it directly to the universe of living sources. Uh, once we made the determination as to what constituted the SAR, we then generated uniformly, um, and this is from the word uniform, for all effective coal plants, uh, and uniformly, again, and this is from the word uniform, for all NGCC. Um, so that uh, the uh, basis of the SCR, the standard which we express the SCR, um, more closely resembles uh, the way in which we set standards um, since uh, uh, the beginning of the history of the implementation of the NAR. Um, now, we did not discard the state target approach. What we did instead is apply the two standards to each state's fleet and generated, as we did a proposal, a state goal. And the state goal is essentially the, the linchpin of allowing states a broad range of options and flexibility for uh, establishing plans and programs to meet the standards. Uh, the menu ranges from simply applying the uniform rate to a state's sources to putting in place a variety of uh, energy programs that yield, in the end, the equivalent um, of the state. Um, in addition, we express this to each state's target, not just as a rate, but also as a mass goal, so that states have the option of using some form of emissions allowance trading, uh, in addition to the option of using emission rate trading. Um, in the, doubling back to the shift from expressing the, the, expressing the obligation not as state goals, in the first instance, um, but as emissions rates for coal plants, emissions rates for gas plants. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, emerged from the comment record um, is that the best system of emission reduction, uh, as we defined it, uh, including measures like dispatch and uh, uh, the increased use of renewable energy, uh, needed to capture the way the utility system which is not uh, a state-by-state -state system, um, but a system that operates over broad multi-state uh, rates. Um, and so the way in which we uh, calculate um, how much and how fast to apply renewable energy, and how much and how fast to apply increased dispatch to NGCC, um, was, uh, was calculated on a grid-wide basis, not on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, as a result of this combination of elements, we think we did a lot to promote the option or promote a range of options that we were asked to promote um, by a good many states that, and in particular by utilities in ways that would really facilitate their adopting compliance strategies that maximize flexibility, uh, including, again, for the use of emission rate emission mass trade. Um, we had proposed uh, that uh, state plans be uh, submitted under uh, uh, a, uh, a three-year three schedule. Um, uh, uh, one, uh, a one-year schedule for states that didn't need an extension, a two-year schedule for uh, standalone state plans that did need an extension, and a three-year schedule for state plans that involve multi-state strategies. And we became persuaded, again, by the ample comments and evidence in the record, that to really be true to the on-the-ground on the reality of state administrative law, uh, which often includes participation by state legislatures, we really needed to accommodate a three-year um, state plan analysis. Um, while some states, we expect, will submit complete plans by September 2016. Um, other states um, had the option of submitting in September 2016, what um, we call an initial submittal that essentially establishes two things. One, a reasonable basis um, for uh, an extension request, and two, some markers of progress that they've started the process of putting their, putting their plans together. Um, and finally, uh, we opened up the set of approaches that were available for states that wanted to uh, adopt state trade. Um, 
what we contemplated the proposal was only one mechanism, and that would be upfront interstate uh, agreements. Um, what we uh, devised, um, thanks to some very good suggestions from some of the folks at the table from other groups, um, is that we build in a kind of trading rate concept. So we described forms of state plans that would have the effect of allowing sources covered by those plan plans to use credits or allowances from other states that themselves had uh, adopted comparable approaches. Um, this slide is, is really a, a way of illustrating the way in which we uh, uh, set the coal rate and the gas rate, and then apply those two rates to the actual existing fleets in each state. Um, so that again, we have rate goals and mass goals for each state, but they are now, instead of the primary expression of the BSER standard, they're derived from establishing that standard on the source level. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the folks in the room um, who have ridden along on this journey with us are, are doubtless familiar with what we call the building block approach. Um, and these were really the three, or now, were the four, now the three building blocks that we used to capture um, what we saw as the best system of emission reduction. Now it can't be emphasized enough, um, because of the way Section 111 works, um, uh, and because of uh, uh, our extensive efforts of engagement and outreach, um, in many ways, what we defined as the BSCR is a mirror of what we heard from states and utilities in terms of what they are already doing, um, either by design um, or as a collateral effect, um, uh, in adopting measures and policies that have the result of producing CO2. Um, so, uh, the BSER uh, really is, a, as much as anything else, a record of what we were told um, states already have experience with, and utilities already have experience with, uh, in terms of what works to reduce uh, carbon pollution. And what we're seeing, and a great many other analysts, both inside and outside the government, seeing, is the prevailing trends going into the future. Uh, in many ways, um, it's the market and already existing utility strategies, already existing state policies that are, um, uh, that are driving uh, the SCR. That's why the focus is on uh, enhancing the operational efficiency of coal fired power plants, increasing dispatch of existing uh, natural gas combined cycle plants, uh, and increasing the, the use and deployment of renewable energy. It's what we've defined as the best way um, to reduce carbon production. Sorry, well, I lost my card. Um, there we go. Um, I've already alluded to this, um, the, the clean power plant timeline, um, taking account of both the state planning process and ultimately the utility implementation uh, process, um, you know, sums out in 15 years. Uh, we expect to see submittals a year from now um, from states uh, uh, laying out the basis of their need for an extension and their uh, sort of down payment in terms of actions that they've been able to, to muster in the first year. Uh, September 2018 is when the plans are due, and uh, January 1st, 2022 is when uh, the compliance period begins. But again, compliance is ultimately defined as uh, an emission uh, reduction total or emission reduction rate met on average over the 2022-2029 period. Um, so many people have observed, uh, and we are not arguing with this observation, that if States or utilities want to resort to a certain amount of backloading for compliance. Um, the way we structure the, the interim target uh, permits that. Um, and we see that as uh, not, a, not an inevitable outcome, but certainly an outcome to uh, be 
instrumental to ensuring reliability and ensuring that innovative technologies have enough time to, to develop uh, and be deployed, uh, including attending in infrastructure investments, such as transmission building rates to accommodate uh, increased use of renewable energy. Um, uh, I think I'm about to reach the point of uh, excessive weediness um, uh, and probably going to lead to Bill, who's in the crosshairs of the, uh, who's, who's members of the crosshairs and figuring out what type of plan they, they want to submit. Um, and if you don't think that chart is too weedy, we can see this one. Um, uh, <coughs> this, folks, is what uh, choice looks like. Um, and what we try to do is being directly responsive to what we were told states wanted to be able to think about is we delineated uh, at least six different ways that states could structure their compliance plans. Um, ranging from rather straightforward uh, cap and trade or emission rate uh, trading systems uh, to systems that put together a combination of requirements that apply directly to the power plants and complementary uh, measures and policies that as, let's say, an ensemble of activities result in meeting the state goal. Um, and uh, what we are looking forward to uh, from the EPA's perspective is a very robust engagement with the states and stakeholders um, in the implementation of, uh, of the state's work in sitting through these options and, and, and coming to a, a conclusion um, as to which ones work the best for states. Um, and a, let me perhaps share what I think is one of the more salient pieces of feedback the EPA has gotten from the utility industry. Um, the utility industry has generally been uh, uh, cordial in terms of engaging with us since uh, since, since the Obama war came out. Not to say that they're entirely supportive of that, but certainly not put words in their mouth, um, and certainly not to anticipate that they will not engage in vigorous litigation for this reason. But at the same time, um, uh, what we're seeing is that the industry is spending a lot of time interacting with us and focusing on their options. And one of the things they have asked us to do, and to us they're going to be asking their states to do, is to start to coalesce around one or two basic approaches that can be applied on a, on a broad, regional, or near nationwide basis so that they, the power plant operators, can be operating in a close to uniform environment with a, uh, a normal and stable price signal uh, in terms of the constraints. So one of the things that we will be supporting, not leading, but supporting um, to the extent that it's appropriate for us to do so, is dialogues between um, utilities and state decision makers in order to perhaps promote, promote an outcome. Um, uh, I will uh, skip past that. I will go to uh, noting um, one other major component of the August 3rd um, signature package. Um, in addition to finalizing the Clean Power Plan, which uh, in the form of a final rule defines the state's obligations um, as triggered by our finalizing a BSER determination and setting standards. Um, we propose the federal plan. Uh, the act specifies that the EPA has authority um, to apply a federal plan to power plants operating in states that do not submit or do not submit approvable state proposed federal plan focuses on a couple of different mechanisms, um, in particular a rate-based trading mechanism and an asset-based trading mechanism. Um, it doesn't reopen questions as to what counts, doesn't count for compliance, doesn't reopen the question of what is BSCR. Um, embedded in, those, in the proposed federal plan are two draft model rules that states can either use informally um, as guidelines or as, uh, as examples for crafting their own plans. Or formally, states will have the option, this is what we propose, um, states will have the option of simply 
incorporating um, the model one or the other model rule. Um, <coughs> you choose to, to finalize one or the other model rule. And again, the model rules are mirror images of the two options that we proposed for, for the federal plan, mass-based trading and mass-based trading. Um, we included one uh, significant uh, voluntary program um, within the Clean Power Plan. It's what we call the Clean Energy Incentive Program. Um, it's a, uh, uh, what we think is a pretty classic state-federal matching fund program. But in this case, the currency is not dollars. Um, it's emissions credits or allowances. Uh, the CEIP is targeted at projects um, that begin uh, in the next couple of years and produce uh, either energy savings or emissions reductions or clean megawatt hours in 2020 and 2021, specifically from wind and solar or from end use energy efficiency products that benefit low income communities. Um, while, as a final matter, we define eligible projects with respect to the kind of generation that counts. Uh, we've set a 300 million ton uh, bank um, of minted federal credits to be used to match um, state credits. Um, but we've left open a number of implementation questions like, for example, what it means to benefit a low-income community, um, how you define a low-income community, um, some of the uh, finer points of what kinds of projects qualify and how to demonstrate that they qualify. And with respect to those implementation questions, we will be conducting the uh, following public process and probably issuing some kind of supplemental guidance or supplemental rule. Um, we've also paid a lot of ten attention um, in the final rule and we directed states to respond in kind in their state plan processes um, to ensure that the concerns of environmental justice communities and other vulnerable communities and stakeholders are taken account of both in terms of the state plan process and the analytics supporting both state plans that are submitted uh, and the implementation of state plans through the course of the program. Um, and I actually think that uh, you've heard enough from me. It's time to return my book over to, uh, to my colleagues.
learning from each other so that there can be as much collaboration and peer to peer learning and assistance as possible. Uh, and so uh, we want to welcome and Thank you, Carol, for that very nice uh, invitation and to, uh, and to your staff for uh, inviting me to uh, represent state and local air pollution control agencies around the country. So I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, following up on the excellent presentation that Joe Goffin made that set the, uh, the table for what is ahead for the states. Uh, but before I do, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I want to describe a little more who we are, uh, what some of the general reactions are to the Clean Power Plan. And I'm going to try to give you a general sense of where states are coming from. Um, all states are different, and you'll find that when I speak about uh, their general view. Uh, how we're working with stakeholders, uh, I'm going to make some comparisons of the state targets to show you how they differ and how some of the state targets have differed from proposed rule to the final rule. Uh, describe a few of the state choices. I have a similar slide uh, that Joe presented on that very complicated um, morass of options, but it's important that you see it maybe five times today. Um, it'll sink in. And then I want to end with um, spending a minute on um, discussing the consequences of standing down, of saying no, of deciding not to engage in this. So, so let's begin. Uh, we are an association, uh, like Carol said, of almost every, not quite, uh, state and local air pollution control agency. Uh, our members are uh, responsible under page one of the Clean Air Act, um, given the primary responsibility of implementing the rules and regulations. And as part of that, um, we are responsible um, working with the state environmental commissioners in developing plans that meet EPA's regulations. Uh, I will share with you some general observations uh, about uh, what we like about the Clean Power Plan and some places where um, perhaps some states feel it's going to be a little more challenging. Uh, first, um, you know, we're very pleased, even during the proposal, that EPA provided a good 15 years to meet the ultimate targets. This should be sufficient time for, um, for electric generating units um, and states um, to implement their programs and meet the final obligations. Um, we were concerned initially that EPA, uh, on top of the 2030 deadline, the 15 years, um, took it away in part in the proposal by establishing an interim timeline that has been referred to as the cliff beginning in 2020 and many stakeholders, not just states felt, that required too much too soon and would set us up for failure. And I think to EPA's credit, they listened and they extended the initial phase of the interim compliance uh, time frame pathway to start in 2022 and that's going to be very helpful. Uh, EPA um, heard loud and clear that um, the timeline for states submitting plans, not just for those that are asking for additional time for a multi-year plan, but just generally states who are establishing uh, a, a single um, state plan uh, needed more than just the one year or perhaps two years. And so EPA for everyone has said, let's give three years for compliance there's a quick pro quo of coming in with the first year plan, but this is going to be very helpful to overcome some of the initial <coughs> problems that we face. Uh, this wasn't so much our issue at the reliability safety valve as uh, the utility industry's issue, but it's one that did affect um, what's going on in the states. And we don't think it's going to be used much, but having a safety valve in the role is helpful and I think gives um, everyone an ability to you know, sleep easier, to know that if things do go awry, then there is uh, a way to address those problems. And finally, and uh, the next slide will demonstrate this, 
Um, perhaps not for everyone, so I don't want to paint too wide a brush, but uh, EPA made some very important changes to the targets to make the targets for many of the states more equitable. And this is a, this is a graph that uh, uh, one of my colleagues in my office uh, put together that uh, shows in the blue the wider range of proposed goals, but in the red, um, they are narrowed considerably. So the, the difference between the, um, the most significant target and the least significant target has been narrowed considerably in the final rule than it was in the proposal. And Joe had mentioned uh, some of those reasons. It has to do with, um, in essence, EPA taking a very conservative view of applying the same emission limit for coal-fired or gas-fired and depending upon the mix of fuels in a state, apply those accordingly. And the gap has been narrowed considerably and it's more equitable. Um, here's another way of looking at the data. Um, this shows the differences between the proposed rules state by state. We've actually identified the states. You could, you could derive this information if you look at the raw data in EPA's rule. We've just made a picture out of it, a graph out of it. But it showed um, the first 10 or 12 states show how obligations have gotten a bit more stringent compared to the proposed rule. And the last, you know, 30-ish states show how the final targets have gotten less stringent. And if you look at this just, just along, you know, what the data shows, um, you could you could argue that um, many of the states, um, everything else being equal, are doing better under a final rule than under the proposed targets, with everything else being equal. That's a simplistic. Conclusion, but this shows um, how things have changed from proposal to final. Um, I don't want to leave the impression that everything was hunky dory uh, amongst the states with regard to the Clean Power Plan. Um, there are still some lingering concerns, and in some states they are legitimate and they're going to have to work a bit harder to get through these. For example, uh, the deadline, even giving three years total for submitting a plan is going to be challenging for some, especially where legislatures only meet every other year or only meet a few months during the year. So this is a complicated rule and it's going to take some extra work, especially by those states who have to adopt special authority to give them the tools to respond. Um, unlike the proposal, uh, states are not giving credit for earlier actions uh, to the chagrin of uh, a number of states. EPA is has taken other um, ways of trying to address that, uh, including the program that, that um, Joe mentioned with the Clean um, Set of Energy uh, program. But, um, but nonetheless, um, actions that were taken several years ago are not necessarily going to be credited as, e as the states had hoped uh, initially. Um, some state targets are going to be difficult. Uh, not everybody did better under uh, the final rule. And even if they did, uh, for some targets, it's going to be a new challenge for them. Most of the states haven't developed compliance plans. They don't have uh, programs for reducing greenhouse gases. And it's going to take um, a new and uh, uh, expansive effort, uh, not only within the agency, but working with other stakeholders who are impacted, unlike most clean air programs. Uh, I mentioned the Clean Power Plan remains complex. It's 1,500 pages, I think, just to get through it, and states are really trying to get through it these days. I know very few people other than my office mate um, who has read the entire document and actually understands it. And uh, finally, and, and for, those, for those of you that are, that are working with, um, for a congressman or a senator, um, this last one is important. Uh, and, I, and, I, and please forgive me for sounding a bit parochial. But um, this program is not going to be implemented by itself. It requires resources. And the Clean Air Act provides state and local air pollution control agencies with money um, that is appropriated by Congress to run programs. And this is a brand new program. The President requested $25 million to help states implement this program. And the Congress over the past couple of years has taken the entire amount out. And, and if it doesn't, 
go through um, this year or even next year, then we will be having to implement this very, very difficult program, resource intensive program, without any new money. And uh, that's, that's problematic. <coughs> okay, so um, we are working um, really well with stakeholders and in a, in a I think, important way, um, this started uh, at the proposed stage. When EPA came out with its proposed rulemaking for the Clean Power Plan, um, states, unlike any time I've ever seen in my over 40 years in Washington, D.C., began sitting down not only with the normal um, folks that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the states reached out to other entities that have heretofore not been involved in policy development on clean air issues, including state energy officials and state utility um, regulators we will hear from in a second. And this was really important because most of the compliance options that will occur as a result of this program will necessitate a close relationship with these energy officials and utility officials. And that those relationships are um, carrying through in the final rule. We already see, not even two months after the promulgation of the final rule, that a number of states, I've just listed a few, have already begun stakeholder processes or sitting down with the utilities or sitting down with other stakeholders, including state uh, regulatory agencies uh, within their state, and try to figure out the best route to take and what they should be pursuing and what they should be avoiding. I think that's very important. There are a number of um, public meetings that are scheduled in the future. Uh, I bet everybody in this room has either been to um, one of these stakeholders' processes or if they call their state regulator, that person could point to a number of ongoing actions. And this is all very good, sharing of information, reaching out, and making, making sure that we understand fully what the repercussions are going to be from any potential compliance strategy that we engage in. And, um, and I, I do want to put an exclamation point on this last item. Um, we've worked really well with um, NASIO and NABU over the past few years. And I'll just tell you a, a quick story. Um, a few years ago, and this is not embellishment, um, we would be at meetings and the State Environmental Energy and Utility Commissioner from the same state hardly knew each other. Either were never introduced, certainly never went to the same meeting, and imagine them having to work together on a common role or a common strategy. And over the past several years, uh, our associations have tried hard to bring these groups together. We all have different missions, but we want to do the right thing. And um, that has really helped uh, address some of these very daunting challenges that our respective uh, groups face. And I keep saying this is really a sign of good government that we're trying to work together in the common good to make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes and that we're trying to adopt strategies that actually mesh together so that we can reach the most cost-effective solution. And I think it's working. Um, so let me give you a snapshot of, of where I and others think states are at this very early stage in meeting their interim standards and their final standards. The first point is information that can be um, derived from the rule, and it's in chart form, and it's very interesting. It says that nine states have budgets uh, in 2012 that are higher, that, are, that have more pollution, more greenhouse gases, than the 2030 target. In other words, Theoretically, they don't have to do anything more to attain their 2030 target. It may not work that way in practice for a number of reasons, but their goal, their pathway, is going to be pretty easy compared to some other agencies. So that's kind of good news for them. There are a number of other states, um, and this is not our analysis. This is one from, I think this was a Union of Concerned Scientists report but I will predict with certainty that there will be other analyses coming out in the weeks ahead that will reaffirm this similar conclusion. And that is, there are 
probably over half the states, in this case 30 states, that are well on their way, that in this case meeting over half of their obligation for the 2022 interim requirement, and about half the states, or close to half, 20 states, are halfway toward meeting today um, their 2030 uh, targets. And why is that? Well, this is because of existing strategies, um, primarily in the Clean Air Act, but elsewhere, ranging from the already announced retirement of coal-fired power plants to the incremental progress we'll make on renewable portfolio standards to uh, energy efficiency resource standards and the like. So states are well on their way toward meeting both the interim 2022 compliance stra uh, interim strategy as well as the 2030 targets. And um, again, um, a lot more work um, needs to be done by a bunch of states and there are a number of tools that will help them. And I'll just put in a plug for something that's on our website that we just published in the last month or two. And this is a menu of options um, that will help any stakeholder who's interested in identifying um, every conceivable control strategy or program that could be adopted in reducing greenhouse gases. Whether it's the Clean Power Plan or a mayor's or congressman's or governor's desire to reduce greenhouse gases, this will identify anything you could possibly think of and also talk about the cost, the cost effectiveness, the potential greenhouse gas reductions, collateral, non-greenhouse gas, air quality benefits, and where that strategy has been employed. Uh, if you go to our website, forcleanair.org, um, you can have a, you can get a copy yourself. Not bad, but at least it's in the site. Here is a, um, so at the last, at, at the first um, point here, I mentioned that nine states have already pretty much done it. Their, their 2030 budget is, uh, target is actually lower than their current 2012 emissions budgets. Here is a graph that shows you those states. And the first nine states are pretty much there. Again, this is in theory, in practice, it may be different, it may depend upon future growth and other factors. But you can see, um, you know, kind of the relative relationship of where states are with regard to the 2012 emissions. Now, the one that really looks steep and scary on the right is Texas. And you would think, oh my gosh, look what they have to do. And I had the same reaction uh, until I learned that um, their obligation, I'm not poo pooing this, but their obligation is, is 21%. They're kind of right in the middle of the pack with regard to the amount of reductions on a percentage basis that they have to make vis-a-vis -vis their total inventory. So they have a lot of emissions, and that's why this looks large. But you know, the first nine or so are the ones that have you know, not much more to do in theory. Um, Joe did a really nice job of teeing up the state choices and um, some of the compliance pathways <laughs> that we'll be engaging in. And these are gonna be, these are gonna be complicated choices. And, and they're not, they're not all, you know, they're not all consistent with one another. You know, we're gonna be, of course, looking at uh, lowest cost options, we're gonna be examining, um, we're gonna try to do things as simply as possible, uh, but sometimes the things that um, appear simple are not, and the ones that are more complicated um, work out better in the end. Um, it's very important for the states, and it's almost without exception, to, pres to preserve state autonomy. Um, we do not want EPA um, to have federal enforceability over some of our programs, especially programs like energy efficiency that have already been employed. And if anyone's in California, they know what I'm talking about with their economy-wide uh, greenhouse gas program. Um, they have a lot of energy efficiency programs, and they're happy you know, enforcing this themselves and don't need interference. And the EPA's credit, they're not looking to do that, but it's an issue that's very sensitive to the states. Um, and we, we will, many states uh, will want to talk with other states and possibly engage in either formal or informal interstate strategies that will really help those states meet their obligations. Uh, this is the exact slide that Joe showed you, um, and I will make three comments about this, just to show you 
the kinds of choices that states are making. The first is, the first choice a state will make is, should they go to a rate phase program, pounds uh, per million BTU, so there's really no cap in emissions, it's based upon the rate of generation of a widget, or should they go to a mass phase program, which is pounds per megawatt hour, so it sets a cap on the amount of emissions that can be um, spewed. And that is, that literally is the first choice that a state is gonna make. And it has a number of repercussions with regard to the stringency of the program and which pathway to choose. This, this chart that EP put together was very helpful. It kind of gives you an idea of um, what, what's involved. The next point I make about it is after you decide whether it's a rate-based program or a mass-based program, you know, there are a number of different options within each. And, you know, if you look at a rate-based program, the pounds per million BTU, if you wanted to adopt, say, an energy efficiency program, there are some criteria that are extremely important that maybe David will get into in a second that, in, that requires regulators to make sure that the energy efficiency gains are indeed credible. And there is something called EM and V, Evaluation, Measurement, and Verification. You know, trust but verify. You want to make sure that what you're getting is indeed accurate and important uh, to uh, count. And in a rate-based, you know, that's not an easy program. There are some protocols out there, but that's something that the states will need to include in their compliance strategies if they want to use energy efficiency. And the third point I'll make is whether it's rate-based or mass-based, um, if one pursues EPA's model rule, um, there are, as Joe mentioned, there are trading-ready programs that um, allow the state to pursue that approach and not have to reinvent the wheel with regard to um, the trading of allowances and the um, credits and, and the ability to, um, um, to be more flexible in implementation. Um, almost done, uh, we, on top of what, our, what EPA is doing, um, we and NACA are developing um, our own model state plan. Um, it is, um, it probably will be similar, but a bit more expansive than EPA's model. The purpose is to have a state-generated product with regulatory language and preamble language that can be used by states um, literally in toto or pieces in the development of their strategies. We are anxious for states to meet their obligations on time. And we're trying to do everything we can, whether it's a menu or a model, um, to help them so that they don't, you know, they're not faced with sanctions or other penalties for not um, meeting these uh, obligations. And we hope to have this out by the end of this, this calendar year. Finally, just I promised I would say a word about um, the consequences of saying no. So um, there are many in Congress, there are some states, and there are others who think it's better uh, to stand down, to say no, and to, and to fight the implementation of this program. And I can, I can only tell you that from our experience, there is nothing, nothing to gain from doing that. And here's why. Um, let's, 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 if a state wanted a federal plan, um, the state has to realize, or if, the, if someone else wanted the federal plan, it's by definition going to be less flexible than a state program. And by being less flexible, it will be more costly, it will be less cost effective, it will not avail the state of the flexibilities in the clean um, energy incentive program that Jay mentioned. Uh, and, and from what we've heard from the utilities who are directly affected by a federal plan, they don't want it. They would prefer having the states develop the plan than having an, a federally imposed plan that restricts their flexibility. And one other point. If, a, if I'm a state and I'm really anxious to have a federal plan, it still doesn't make sense because what, what I could do is take a look at the federal plan, see how it addresses my concerns, and then take the best pieces of the federal plan and augment it with 
some other state strategies that might make that federal plan even more palatable to the state. There is nothing to be gained by implementing or being subject to a federal plan other than calling attention to oneself. And you know, given the importance of this program, I don't think that's really a good alternative. So with that, I'll conclude and say, um, you know, to EPA's credit, uh, they did engage in an unprecedented level of, of stakeholder involvement. And I think the final rule, while not perfect, and while it does have some concerns, and it is going to be challenging, does reflect that EPA listened in large part. Um, we hope that uh, no states will reject a federal plan and work with their stakeholders in implementing this program. Um, from what we can tell, people are working very, very quickly and responsibly in starting that process. And there are plenty of tools, not just ours, to help states. So with that, I say thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, and I do want to mention that Joe's and Bill's slides will be available on, on EESI's website uh, probably by the end of the afternoon. And so I know that these have been very, very difficult to, to see, uh, but that will give you a chance to really look at them in much more detail. <coughs> so we're now going to turn to David Terry, who is Executive Director of the National Association of State Energy Officials, NASIO. And David has been with NASIO for about 15 years and has ably led that organization uh, in all sorts of matters uh, in in terms of working with the state energy offices uh, that are located in 56 state and territory energy uh, offices across the country. NASIO uh, and I should say state energy offices are involved with a wide range of energy uh, and energy policy issues that we often probably don't realize. And so it's important to understand the huge amount of responsibility that they have and therefore hopefully the whole role that they can play as Bill was saying in terms of working with the air regulators and certainly with, with the utilities in their states since they um, work on, on a whole variety of national energy issues including natural gas uh, and electricity, uh, buildings, energy efficiency, renewable energy policies, industrial energy efficiency, as well as working in the whole area and being responsible for energy emergency response and reliability. Very, very critical issues as we know. So David? Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks for uh, your time this afternoon. Just following up on some remarks that Bill made, um, I think the uh, collaboration between our three organizations and more importantly our organization's membership has been uh, uh, remarkable. It's made things, I think, go as well as they have. The input we were able to provide to EPA, um, I think, in the formation of the rule um, was certainly helped by that collaboration. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, things to give you a sense of the lens that our members bring to this issue. First of all, there's obviously a great deal of diversity among the states with regard to the Clean Power Plan. And for that reason, NASIO has not taken a position on the Clean Power Plan. What we have worked hard to do, uh, along with our colleagues here today, is to ensure that flexibility um, and state options were preserved, and certainly reliability, uh, and also affordability. Uh, to give you a sense of where our members come from, they are typically appointed by their governors. They either inform uh, or advise the governor on energy policy, broadly speaking. That's as distinct from regulation. So uh, many of them, the vast majority, work on leading comprehensive statewide energy plans and energy in every sector, not just electricity. So uh, they bring that sort of a lens to, to bear as well as uh, an economic development lens. As, as uh, is no surprise to anybody, uh, governors, legislators are obviously always focused on uh, uh, economic development is a part of what they do. So those are maybe some caveats to how the energy offices have approached this activity. Uh, I just want to touch on a, a few key points, um, uh, following up a little bit on what Bill said with regard to some of the issues that are being looked at with, uh, with efficiency. Uh, one of the areas we focused on in our work has been efficiency because it's someplace there's broad agreement that there are many no regrets uh, elements uh, to that work. It's certainly a least cost approach in most cases, so, we've, so we spent a lot of time there. And also a little bit about what we've heard recently from our members 
I had the good fortune of having a workshop uh, about uh, two weeks ago, and I'll touch on that as well. But I think first and for foremost, we've been listening to our states. And uh, in the case of our members, they look at not only the investor-owned utility efficiency programs, which are largely overseen by um, the utility commissions across the country, but also the efficiency programs and policies that the state carries out in other areas, whether that's building energy codes, efficiency resource standards, or importantly, from our members' perspective, private sector voluntary efficiency efforts. Uh, the sum total of those sort of non-utility program efficiency efforts are uh, significantly larger than the utility efforts from a dollar perspective. In the public buildings sector alone, there's about six to seven billion dollars in cost-effective, uh, no cost to the taxpayer, no cost to the ratepayer, privately financed efficiency improvements in state and local buildings across the country, as one example. There are many other examples. So we look at those opportunities to help uh, integrate that with uh, the plans that states will develop as a least cost option to help bring down um, uh, the cost of compliance that we think is important. One of the, I think, great benefits of the process that we've had engaging Mayruk and Nazio and many outside stakeholders from the private sector, including utilities, has been to, to really broaden the, the perspective of what efficiency could include and then get into the more difficult uh, challenges of how we count that in a way that's uh, reasonable and appropriate from an air regulator perspective um, uh, that has to, to uh, implement this plan on the state level. Uh, one of the places that I think uh, I would point you to if you have uh, time uh, after after today's event is to look at some of the principles that Nazio, Mabrik, and NACA developed before the rule came out, uh, addressing a whole range of issues from uh, National Energy Efficiency Registry, which I'll address in a moment, uh, reliability concerns, uh, affordability concerns, and many of those things were picked up in EPA's final rule and has, has made that uh, process better. Uh, moving on to some of the more recent activities and things we're hearing from our states, as I mentioned, we had a uh, clean power plan workshop at the uh, uh, NASIO annual meeting about two weeks ago on September 16th. We had uh, energy officials from around the country at the meeting from virtually every state. Uh, we had senior staff from NACA and from NARIC there as well to provide input um, and help uh, uh, provide views from each of their organizations. And I think the, the major takeaway is one that, that Bill actually touched on nicely in his state choice slide, and that is uh, there's a lot of diversity in the choices that states have to make in the plans. And I think one of the things that we want to be careful to avoid in the advice and help we provide states is not to uh, predetermine which path they take. There are reasons a state might take a mass-based approach. There are reasons states might take a rate-based approach. What we want to see uh, from an ASIA perspective is that we are taking least cost uh, uh, approaches going forward, and, and principally that includes efficiency, but it includes other resources as well. I think the other piece that we heard from our members more directly is the clean power plan is certainly having a significant impact on the electricity system, but there were many uh, changes, a transformation really underway in the electricity sector long before the clean power plan was even, even considered or on the table. Um, certainly a, a, a huge uh, move toward natural gas because of low cost and also low emissions and a variety of other uh, reasons. Uh, many new energy efficiency and energy technologies that make uh, higher of efficiency possible, um, uh, microgrids, uh, LED lighting, just a whole variety of approaches uh, to energy efficiency and to the use of energy and the distribution of energy and the production of energy that weren't available uh, five and ten years ago. All of those things are coming to bear in the state planning process that, that sits alongside this activity. So uh, it is complicated, but I think on the other side of this, we have a uh, move toward a really more robust and vibrant electricity sector in the long term when you take into account uh, the uh, investments in infrastructure and resilience that go along with um, these changes uh, beyond the clean power plan. Uh, the, uh, other item I want to touch on is uh, measurement and eva evaluation, measurement and verification (EM and V). Uh, we have found generally, uh, for those of you familiar with, uh, particularly with investor-owned utility efficiency programs, there are there's a long history uh, and good examples of EM and V. Uh, there is a long history and great examples in the private sector uh, with energy savings performance contracting, the efficiency programs that are applied to state and local buildings, and a variety of other programs. Many of those have been noted by EPA, by the states, by our organizations. And I think um, the key takeaway in that area is, while it's important to get uh, the savings verified and get them right, uh, I also think it's important to not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, we, have, uh, we do have interests uh, in the private sector and the public sector of making 
of V, I think, so difficult that it would make efficiency uh, go from being challenging and a great opportunity to something that would be virtually impossible. And so that's an issue we're paying close attention to, and we're certainly hearing from our members on that as well. Um, one other, uh, I think, in important service that all three of our organizations provide, uh, but NASU is taking in a little different direction, is responding to our members' questions. Uh, we're setting up uh, a new service called Answering State Questions that was launched on September 16th. We'll take questions from any state uh, entity. Certainly it's focused on state energy offices, but it applies broadly to the Clean Power Plan. We'll take the questions that come in. Uh, we'll refine those if they need to be informed or expanded. Uh, provide those to EPA in an attempt to get an answer in a way that uh, hopefully moves everybody forward, makes that process uh, efficient. And we also have a group of experts, including uh, folks from the Regulatory Assistance Project, ACEEE, other organizations, and we'll certainly share the questions with NARUC and NACA as well, but in an attempt to respond to the, the state's questions in this area. So uh, I think that's an important new activity. Uh, again, we'll focus on trying to walk through the individual questions states have, but hopefully those will apply, apply more broadly and uh, we can learn more rapidly uh, uh, as the planning goes forward. We have a few projects underway that, that run in parallel to our assistance to states, state energy offices in this area that we think of as sort of no regrets activities. Uh, one of those is work on an energy efficiency registry, a national energy efficiency registry. This is being carried out uh, by an organization called the Climate Registry along with several other partners. Uh, our role in this is working alongside seven states uh, that are uh, going to be working on the governance rules for that registry led by Tennessee, uh, also including Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, and Oregon. Uh, to be clear, that registry, although it has great application for this particular rule, it has great application for many other state activities, uh, reaching uh, agreed upon energy goals, efficiency goals that the state has, uh, meeting other air uh, requirements that are in place, and it brings a level of transparency and uh, fungibility of the uh, efficiency credits um, uh, that, are, that are out there. And I think it also opens the door to a wider range of efficiency activities, uh, some of those private sector efficiency activities that are voluntary in nature, for example. Uh, I think lastly, uh, the thing that we're hearing most, and, and it's really been something we've been uh, changing our emphasis over the past three or four months, uh, we had initially focused largely on national issues with regard to the Clean Power Plan, working with the states and how uh, we might impact EPA's rule. Uh, we have gradually shifted to providing more assistance to the states on an individual basis, and certainly a lot of the planning activities, the stakeholder processes um, that will, uh, are both underway and need to be underway are something that will support with some of our experts on staffs and certainly uh, NAC and NARUC as we move forward. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, David. Um, and then we'll turn to our final presenter, uh, Charles Gray, who is the Executive Director of NARUC, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Chuck has been the Executive Director of NARUC for uh, 20, uh, well, since 1999 and has uh, been uh, working with NARUC uh, basically for his whole career. And uh, we are delighted to have him here today. He has, he knows so much about utilities at the state level, all of the commissioners, how they, how they function, what their needs are, uh, so many different issues. We are delighted to have you join us. Thank you. Thanks, Carol, for the, for the kind introduction. Um, that was very nice. And uh, I think we're supposed to be done at 2.30, so I'm going to go very quickly so there's time for uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, really pleased to see Joe here today. Um, EPA has reached out to our members uh, in, in a way that we've never seen before from very many federal agencies. And it's been, I think, a, a, an exceptional, an exceptional uh, relationship that we've, we've, we've carved out with them. So thank you, Joe. Um, I've got the standard disclaimers that, uh, that uh, David had as well. Um, first, these are just my words. I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of any given specific NARUC members. And secondly, we too have taken no position on the Clean Power Plan. Uh, we have members that have, and uh, 
And I think once the, the rule is, is put on the Federal Register, we'll see which side of the litigation our members are on. I expect we'll see members on both sides of the litigation as it goes forward. To those of you who don't know um, what NARIC does, uh, we represent the State Utility Commission. So our members regularly electric service, natural gas service, water, telecommunications and the like, on it, and regulate their economics, so their economic regulators. Um, what that means is that the states, that uh, the state commissions uh, will have a, a large say in how the compliance plans are written, even though they won't be the principal uh, authors, if you will, of the, of the plans. Um, almost everything that utilities do fall within, within the jurisdiction of either the state commissions or FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which has been very active in working on this as well. Uh, they regulate transmission and wholesale market issues as well. Um, so uh, we need co coordination, I think, with the three ends. With the three ends, I won't go into that any further because I, I agree with both of uh, both um, David and Bill about the importance of all that. Uh, right now, our members are just considering what I call threshold issues, and I think we've heard some of them already up here today, uh, whether to do their own plan or do, to d defer to the federal plan, whether to do a single state plan or a multi-state plan, uh, whether to participate in the Clean Energy Incentive Program, whether to ask for more time, or whether to do a rate-based or a mass-based uh, approach. Um, I think the states are just beginning to, d to digest the rule, and as, I th and as we move forward, though, some of their choices will become clearer. Uh, one thing we're learning, and I think I'm, I appreciate Bill mentioning the money that was not appropriated, um, is that the resource uh, poor right now. All of state agencies, this is a heavy lift uh, implementing this this uh, this rule. It's something I think that from the state commission perspective that we haven't really seen uh, in my tenure, which is a long one, um, at this at this scope and, and importance moving forward. Um, I won't go into a lot of the, well, the, the work the three ends have done together. You've heard a lot of that. Uh, uh, we are, um, we started working together actually back in the Carter, uh, the, the Clinton administration years and years ago, and I'm still I can remember that sort of, and. Um, so we started the membership, uh, the relationship about three or four years ago, and I think it's been very important to the, the success that we're likely to have. Uh, what's NARUG's take on the, on the Clean Power Plan? Well, our focus is primarily on two issues, and uh, David mentioned them as well, reliability and affordability. Uh, we are working very closely with FERC, as I mentioned, um, and uh, as they were developing the proposal with the safety the safety valve. Uh, we didn't take a, an official position on that, but many of our members were quite pleased to see it in the EPA rule when it was issued. Uh, we anticipate moving forward that the quarterly meetings that uh, EPA, FERC, and DOE are planning to hold under the rule, as I understand it, um, that we have some, some, some participation in that. Uh, we also have, a, have representatives on the planning committee of the North American Electrical Liability Co Corporation, sort of an obscure agency uh, called NERC, um, as they prepare to provide technical support and analysis of the impact of the clean uh, power plan on grid reliability. Um, just touching on some of the issues that, um, the threshold issues I mentioned, uh, and I'll just finish with this. What, what we're hearing from some of our state commissioners as they go forward on what their choices are, are, are likely to be in the next in the next uh, few few months. Um, the first question: Should a state submit a plan, or should it defer to the federal implementation plan? Uh, my sense is that even states that don't particularly in, uh, care about the care for the, the, the CPP are going to work on plans, and the commissions in those states they're, they're Attorney Generals may end up litigating the, 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 the rule itself, but the, the, they clearly see the benefit and flexibility and control that doing a state plan uh, gives them. Uh, so I, I anticipate there will not be a large number of states that, and I think Bill's sermon probably convinced them, um, that uh, we're, uh, uh, we'll, we'll defer to the federal government. Should a state request an, uh, an extension to file their plans? I think from what we're hearing, a lot of states are going to ask for extensions. Um, although I did see in the 
trade press today that the governor of Pennsylvania has sworn on a stack of Bibles to have the, his plan filed next year, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, Rate-based versus mass-based. Um, a lot of the, the discussion there it seems to be in favor of a, of a mass-based approach from the, the state commissions. I think they're familiar with um, how cap-and-trade programs work, have worked in the past, and with the SO2 rule under the acid rain uh, uh, program as well as some of the other programs. Um, however, I also read in the, the press today that Georgia looks like they may go, for example, for a, a rate-based program simply because of the nuclear plants that they're, they're planning to build and, and get credit for. So uh, it's advantageous for them to do that. They may be in an island as a result, but uh, we'll see. Um, another uh, issue coming up, should a state submit its own plan to EPA or opt for a multi-state or regional plan? Um, as I think we've heard, uh, the electricity grid is not a single state plan. It is a regional plan. It is, uh, there are three interconnections in the United States. Uh, Texas is, uh, has its own uh, interconnection, but the rest of the other two uh, interconnections actually are in many states. The grid is interstate, the markets are interstate, and I think we're going to see compliance plans taking that into account. Um, there also is, I think, a, a growing understanding that multi-state plans can be cheaper, can help uh, be, the be more reliable and uh, more efficient. Uh, should a state authorize trading as a compliance strategy, that sort of goes hand in, hand in glove with the with a multi-state uh, approach, and uh, uh, I, I suspect we're going to see uh, the, the real interest in, in doing trading uh, as, a multi, as a compliance plan going forward. Um, there's a growing number of studies that support why we should do that. Um, unfortunately, I think the state commissions are going to have a say in how that's, that's structured, the trading, the trading uh, regimes, uh, simply because uh, if it's done by a utility, it, it implicates rates, it implements costs, so uh, the state commissions will have a, a say in that. Uh, what, what we what might see is a lot of uh, uh, involvement in, in the state legislatures and the governors on questions like that, and we'll see how that uh, uh, unfolds and how that affects what the states are trying to do. Um, we've got about four minutes left for, the, for Q and A, so I'll sit right down now. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. You whizzed it right through a lot of very, very important things. And I want to thank our panelists for very, very thoughtful uh, discussions. And um, let's open it up for a few concise questions uh, from, from all of you. Any questions? Okay, we'll start over here. Um, I have a question for uh, the panel in general. What is your sense of a rate-based versus a mass-based program being more advantageous for implementing renewable energy? Does everybody want to speak at once? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, I don't speak for. Uh, I don't want to speak for the agency, one of the other members on the panel. Um, first of all, uh, let me just uh, thank my fellow panelists for uh, validating my comment about how hard um, uh, they and their members are working. I think, you know, without even trying, you illustrated what a huge investment um, uh, you all have made. And I guess the slogan is, we're EPA and you're here to help us. Um, I, you know, there, there, uh, there are going to be two schools of thought about that, and that's what drove our uh, being very even-handed in putting out a rate-based option and a, and a mass-based option. There are many people who think that um, to the extent that any megawatt hour uh, that carries with it zero carbon emissions um, is going to have uh, economic value that's realizable in the electricity market and in the compliance market. And there are those who think that um, uh, under a rate-based program, the generation of an emission reduction credit uh, in monetizing um, uh, uh, in the form of an ERC in emission reduction credit, um, uh, the, the value of renewable energy is, is important. Uh, and we've heard both sides of that, and, and 
So, you know, we've designed an agnostic program. Um, and there may be other factors in the way energy is regulated at a state level that end up being decisive, um, not, inherent, not the inherent design of, of the program. Go ahead. Are you going to say something, though? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so there's more to learn about all of that. We'll go here and then over to Mark. Okay, we're here first. I wonder if any of the panelists have uh, looked into the problem of uh, regulatory or litigious uh, delays. Uh, I, I understand it in 2010, a study of many hundreds of energy plant, energy projects that have been stalled or discontinued because of NEPA uh, uh, litigation. Of 45% of those turned out to be renewable energy. So conceivably, the states wanted to do something innovative or that uh, took a new path, there could be such problems. Have, have you looked into this issue? Is there any any steps taken to try to minimize those kinds of problems? Well, I'll take a shot at this. Um, I won't comment on any, you know, NEPA delays or not, but um, I can comment on the state and local permitting agencies' responses to major projects. Uh, we've testified on this in the past, and um, what we have found is when states receive a complete application, a complete application uh, from the entity seeking the uh, permit, um, we act very quickly on those. There have been some criticisms in the past that um, it takes you know, many years to get through some of these permit applications, but when we then examine what the reasons were, you know, almost without exception, it's because we would, ha we would get a permit from the the applicant that just wasn't uh, satisfactory. I, I will make one more comment. You know, the dynamic here is, is, is very different now. We are going to be relying on a lot of these projects, including renewable portfolio standards and the like, uh, to meet our compliance strategies. And that's going to be important to governors, and it's going to be important to other elected officials and non-elected officials in the area. And that will place a tremendous amount of pressure we already have the pressure, but even more on state and local regulators to make quick actions. But we're not going to circumvent the requirements that uh, we have to um, meet with regard to the review of those projects. Okay, Mark. I have a question where I follow up a similar line and from something Chuck said. It's interesting when you think about it, cap and trade from the point of view of utilities and regulators is irrelevant. Because suppose the state says, we'll do cap and trade, the utility still has to make the choice, well, do I buy some credits, or do I do efficiency or renewables? And of course, if they say, I'm going to do efficiency or renewables, they're simply back at the PUC to make sure we've got the institutional structure to let them make that efficient choice. So in a certain sense, frequently you hear people say, just do cap and trade. But the answer is that cap and trade starts the process. It doesn't end it from the point of view of the, the regulator. That's right. No, no. Um, I, I think the state commissions have, are familiar with cap and trade. They've, they, it's, it's not a new thing. Um, when we were working with Waxman Markey, you know, there was a lot of state interest in doing that. I mean, there's a lot of opposition. That was very political as well, but there was, I think, an, uh, a feeling that we can do this back then, and I think we're still seeing that now, and I think. Uh, it's just the start of the decision-making process from the utility commission. They want to see is that the, is that the right prudent choice that the utility did this versus that, and that won't change. I think that's that's going to continue um, regardless of how the you know the the path that that a state takes. We'll get back to that. Yeah. Thanks. I would just add to that. I think there's Chuck's absolutely correct as as you are, but there's an end, and the end is. There's a McKinsey study from eight or ten years ago that says we spend in this country on the order of $60 billion a year on energy efficiency, not, not counting renewables, just efficiency. Of that amount, there's probably seven or eight billion that's under the purview of the utilities, the utility commissions, 
Now, not all of the rest is something we can count and, and, and aggregate very well, but there's obviously a huge amount. And so from a cap and trade perspective, or, or an aggregation of, of that, those efficiency savings, there needs to be some kind of a certifying body or some kind of approach or process to capture those as well. And it does begin there, but I just think it's that going back to the least cost uh, perspective, if we leave those other things just uh, lie on the table and don't count them from a state perspective, we will absolutely cause uh, ratepayers, consumers, businesses to pay more than they need to for this approach. And that, that's our principal concern about that issue. Just a quick point. Your point is well taken. Uh, all I can say, and we are agnostic to the compliance strategy a state um, pursues, whether it's cap and trade or you know something else. But when you talk with Northeastern and Mid-Atlantic officials who have spent the past decade implementing this program, um, they are um, at the front of the line telling others um, all the benefits of considering such a program. And if this program were called peanut butter and jelly and not cap and trade, you know, I would, you know, it, it, would, it would take off like gangbusters, but because cap and trade, you know, has such um, sort of a pejorative um, tone to it, uh, people immediately close their eyes. But um, for those who are affected by all this, all I say is, and you're not in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic, spend some time talking with those that have been engaged in this, and you will learn, as I have, um, how much easier it is. They've done all the tough stuff, and they've made, you know, they've, they, they have the experience, and they've kind of made mid-course corrections. Um, they will tell you how much easier it is to go in that route than it is to do it on your own. But, but we are agnostic to that, but it's just a, an observation I would share. I'm running for the House of Delegates in Virginia, 47th District. We have three uh, train stations, Boston, Virginia Square, etc. Uh, thank you for uh, having this meeting. I wanted to know that other than for litigators, what incentives for innovation and jobs are built into the Clean Power Plan? What can we say to people? in Virginia say that there might be incentives for innovation in energy production and, and green jobs. Well, the, um, from, from EPA's perspective, we did actually do an, a, we did an analysis um, that answers that question in part. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that um, compliance uh, is something that will require investment and uh, you know maybe try to unite the discussion uh, of a minute ago with the answer to this question it's uh, cap and trade systems or emission of credit trading systems really just provide the medium for the market for compliance as mark cooper suggested and the other panelists suggested um, you know, emission reduction credits or allowances that are tradable don't just appear overnight uh, uh, through spontaneous generation. Someone has to go out and uh, raise capital and hire people um, to uh, adopt these compliance measures. Uh, and uh, in some ways, um, uh, we know that this industry will be making hundreds of millions of dollars of investments every year just to, to keep going, if you will, and to respond to changes that they have to face even without environmental controls. What environmental controls do is add an, an increment um, of, of, uh, of spending and hiring um, uh, to ensure that those investments result in cleaner generation. Um, okay, we'll take one last question back here. This isn't really a question, but a response also to, to your question. Um, and I think um, Joel would agree that there was a provision put in the final rule which encouraged states or allowed states to include in their plans um, carbon neutralization, which is, a, which is like using CO2 to create valuable products, and I think EPA included that in order to make sure that that, that innovative approach, which is certainly in stages, but that that innovative approach doesn't get shut down by keeping language like that out of the rules. So I think they tried to make sure to keep
keep open the innovative um, options. Okay, thank you. Um, did you have one last question? Thank I have one that's kind of a two-part question. Um, a lot of states are grappling with pretty major policy issues like how to deal with net metering tariffs and caps, whether to raise them or not, um, reforming energy efficiency and renewable mandates, at-risk uh, nuclear plants in the Midwest. So do you see the Clean Power Plan as putting an economic value on carbon dioxide? And, do you, and if so, do you see that as um, helping states address some of these issues? I think it's a great question, and, and it's what I maybe inartfully alluded to in my remarks about there were so there are so many other things underway in the electricity sector, the energy sector at large, but uh, all the things that you mentioned. I I think it, it does add a certain value to carbon, at least in in uh, in the thinking about what energy resources a state taps. But I do think it also uh, begs that larger question of a more comprehensive look at how we do electricity system planning and and the policies around that. So I think it. It adds to that. It's another piece of the puzzle. There are a lot of other, a lot of other drivers, including other recent state and federal uh, environmental regulations, but certainly technologically um, and the kind of infrastructure investments that are underway for aging infrastructure in the electric sector already. I think all add to that. So I think it's 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 one piece of a, a larger puzzle, puzzle, and I think it probably adds a bit to that in terms of uh, sense of urgency. So uh, a year ago, I would have said, I don't know. Uh, when we started developing our menu of options, um, we kind of spread the word that we're looking for information from those affected by this proposed rule and now final rule as to what kinds of opportunities are there from your e economic sector that might benefit um, not only reducing greenhouse gases, but also helping their industry. And I'm not exaggerating when I say we were inundated with um, you know, meeting requests. We probably met with 20 separate industries more than once, and we quickly learned that um, smart stakeholders, smart industries, view this role as an opportunity. Whether it's you know, hiring people um, to the delegates question, or whether it's um, finding a competitive edge, um, it, it really was quite amazing how you can take this rule that many people are complaining about and turn this into an opportunity. And, um, and, and one more opportunity that we haven't really talked about that I know we don't have time to, is even if um, somebody just really disliked the notion of reducing greenhouse gases, there are collateral, very important air quality health benefits um, that also have job implications, by the way, that occur from this, reducing fine particles that kill people, reducing sulfur dioxide, reducing smog forming emissions, all are a collateral benefit from this program. So smart people like yourselves should look at this as not just an additional <coughs> imposition on industry, but an opportunity to really gain a competitive advantage. Um, thank you, Bill, because I think that was a very good way to close this up in terms of really recognizing that while the Clean Power Plan um, has a, 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 you know, a key function in terms of how to reduce greenhouse emissions, at the same time, it was done to make sure that there could be multiple, multiple benefits and question, other questions with regard to health, clean air, clean environment, also addressed. And so I think that it is an opportunity. And your comment also reminded me of um, a note I'd received from a board member saying that in August, there was a major letter that was sent by um, a large number of investors to major corporations across the country talking about how important it was for the Clean Power Plan to move forward as opposed to being stopped um, because of looking ahead and looking at all of the opportunities and the need to really address all of these multiple uh, problems that have multiple benefits if we address them. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank 
all of our wonderful, wonderful panelists for their very, very thoughtful, careful presentations. A lot of information. Uh, we'll try and have these, the presentations and everything up on the website as soon as possible. Look forward to your further questions. Please, please let us know. Uh, we want to help make sure that all of this is able to proceed in a way that can be as collaborative as what you have seen the work that is going on by these organizations by really trying to look at the issues and how can we solve them together. So thank you all very, very much for being here. <laughs>